Hello and welcome to episode 2 of my series of RabbitMQ EasyNet Q videos. Today we're going to set up some RabbitMQ servers on a Windows and Linux machine. And um, we're going to see that it's uh, pretty straightforward and simple. So first let me just uh, talk about where you can run RabbitMQ uh, server specifically. And pretty much any place is the answer. Um, Windows, of course. Um, Linux uh, slash Unix. You can run it on the distributions listed here. I'm sure you can do it on other distributions as well. Mac OS. We'll be covering that um, today, but you certainly can. I also won't be covering Cloud and Puppet and uh, Docker and all that, but those all uh, work with Rabbit. You can all check it out there on the RabbitMQ website. Um, as far as actually writing code that inter interacts with Rabbit, whether it's producing messages, sending them to Rabbit, or it's consuming messages from Rabbit and doing some work based on those, again, pretty much everywhere. So here's just a list of, of some, and I've put a, uh, some platforms in here that you might not have thought of when you think of uh, RabbitMQ and sort of the latest technology landscape. But yes, there is COBOL support. There is uh, Cold Fusion support. Now, I, I will say that some of these libraries are officially supported, and some of them are sort of community supported. So if you're a Cold Fusion developer, don't hold your breath waiting for an official library, for instance. But uh, Java, .NET, Ruby, PHP, uh, etc., those all are going to have at least one library. Certainly uh, .NET, which is what I'm focusing on, has uh, a supported Rabbit library as well. And just a review from last time, we talked about Rabbit being middleware, and that's sort of the, the box arrow, box arrow that I showed you last time. Just to reiterate, the structure I'm thinking about, and obviously you can use Rabbit for lots of other stuff, but I'm thinking web app it ends up producing messages that go to Rabbit uh, into the queue there, and then a consumer pulls messages from the queue and does some amount of work. So when I say that Rabbit server can run on anything and uh, any sort of developer can interact with Rabbit, that gives us so much flexibility. So just a couple examples I've shown here that are kind of absurd, but if I have an ASP.NET app running on IIS server, that can send messages to a RabbitMQ server on Ubuntu Linux. And then in turn, a COBOL consumer can uh, turn around and actually pull messages from that Ubuntu server. Now that seems kind of silly, but it's it's totally feasible. Uh, uh, likewise, PHP on Apache, you could uh, push messages to a RabbitMQ on a Windows server, and then you could consume those with a consumer written in Node.js, etc. And you can mix and match. You can have a PHP ASP.NET send the same type of message to um, a RabbitMQ cluster, which might have nodes that are in Ubuntu, in Windows, in Mac, etc and multiple consumers in different languages all pulling the same type of messages and, and doing work based on them. So you get the idea there. Lots of flexibility. Now, uh, what I'm going to do in this video is we're going to install RabbitMQ server on an Ubuntu machine that I have right here in my office. There's an old laptop right there. I've got Ubuntu installed on. I'm going to use apt-get to install that. It's the easiest way to do so, I think. I'm also going to show you how to install it on a Windows machine. In this case, Windows 10 is what I have here, but uh, I'm going to use Chocolatey NuGet, which is kind of similar to AppGet. If you've not heard of Chocolatey NuGet, I highly recommend you checking it out um, for, for your Windows installations. It makes your job of installing and updating things much easier. It's not nearly as mature or popular, I'd say, as AppGet yet, but they just had a Kickstarter. Um, they got some great um, community involvement, and they're really starting to pick up steam. And I think in a year or two, uh, I, I won't have to give you this sort of uh, introduction to chocolate and nougat because it'll be so uh, common and well-known. So once I get those installed, which won't take very long, I'm then going to show you how to enable the management UI for both those installations. It's this basically the same thing for both, but I'll, I'll walk you through both of them just in case. I think that's a useful tool, and so I'll just take you through a quick tour of the management UI so you can see sort of the basics of what's going on in RabbitMQ. And, and that's all we're going to do in this video. 
and later on in the next video we'll actually start writing some code to interact with with Rabbit. But for now we're just going to do the basic setup. Alright, so I'm going to start by doing a remote desktop connection to the Linux machine that's over here. And this is the uh, local IP address uh, for that, so I'll just connect to it. And I'll just log in to that machine. And this may not look like Ubuntu, uh, that's because I am using remote desktop connection, so it's a slightly different um, Windows Manager. Why isn't it connecting? Let's see. Let's try it again. Maybe I hit the password wrong. Yeah, I must have typed the password in incorrectly. Okay. So there we go. We have a connection happening. And so it's not maybe the normal Ubuntu desktop you're used to seeing, but trust me, this is Ubuntu. Um, so I'll go here to System, and then let's go to Xterm. So here we are. I've called my machine Mr. Robot. If you haven't watched the show, check it out. It's fun. Um, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do sudo apt get install. So sudo just says uh, run as a super user, super user do, right? Uh, apt get is the um, sort of a, I don't know, like an app store kind of, if you've never heard of this before, um, for Linux distros like Ubuntu. And install means I want to install a program. And I'm going to say, I want you to install RabbitMQ, I think it's called RabbitMQ dash server. So I have to enter my password again. Okay, so it's going to go out and try to download RabbitMQ server and all the dependencies RabbitMQ server needs to actually install. So that's all the noise going on right now. It already has some libraries installed. So it's setting it up right now. And it's actually, part of the install, it's starting the message broker. So it's actually kicking it on for us. So at the end of that, here we are. We're back to the prompt. RabbitMQ server is installed and running. Now, I want to actually check out the plugins, because with Rabbit, there's actually a number of plugins you can add and install. So we'll just do sudo Rabbit plugins, and then I'll just do a, I think, list of plugins. So it'll show me all the plugins uh, that I have available to me, and none of them are checked. So I actually want to install a plugin here, so uh, sudo rabbit MQ plugins, I want to enable, not install, enable the rabbit MQ management management plugin. Okay. So it enabled that plugin and then other plugins that uh, it needs to actually function. So if I do a rabbit MQ plugins list again, you'll see that now some of them are checked. When I actually enabled that plugin, it told me that I need to restart the Rabbit service. So on Linux here, I can just say sudo service rap, rabbit, rabbitmq server and restart. So that will restart the message broker for me. And as we'll see on Windows, it's very similar. You just bring up the services console is one way you can do it and find Rabbit and just restart it. So at this point, I have an Ubuntu machine. Like I said, it's over here. It's running RabbitMQ Message Broker, RabbitMQ Server, and I also have the management, um, the management UI enabled. So if I bring up a browser, now this browser is on my desktop, my Windows machine, but if I go to 192.168.18 in the browser, and I use a port of 15672, and that's the default port. I bring it up here and I get a RabbitMQ console. And I believe the default login and password is guest and guest. So you probably want to change that before you go to production. But now I have the RabbitMQ uh, console here. And we'll get more into that and go over uh, some of these uh, tabs and, and what you're seeing here in a minute. But I want to walk you through the Windows portion of it next. Here I am on Windows. And what I've done is I've opened Windows PowerShell and I'm running it as an administrator. And to use Chocolatey, it's, it's similar to what I did before. I don't have to say sudo because I'm already administrator on Windows, but I'll say Choco. That's short for Chocolatey. And I want to say, uh, let's just start by doing a list, uh, dash L, that's local list. So these are all the packages that I've used Chocolatey to install uh, to date. So 
I've used it to install Git, I've used it to install 7-zip and um, WinMerge and, and useful things like that. But now I want to actually Choco install and the name of it, if you go to chocolatey.org, you can actually find these names or you can list them here in the command line. It'll be a big list though. Uh, just Choco install RabbitMQ. It's going to do the same thing, a similar thing that apt-get is doing. Um, it's going to ask me to run this script, yes or no. Um, I, can, I can turn off interaction if I want to, but I haven't done that yet. So it's just going to go out and install RabbitMQ and any other of the um, dependencies that it might have. Uh, I don't think there's any in the Windows version. So we'll just wait for that to install. Now it's installed. Uh, there were some windows that popped up here and there, but uh, I've edited those out. Uh, you can just pretty much ignore those, but now Chocolatey is installed. So now if I go to uh, Windows 10 here and I type in Rabbit MQ, I get a bunch of interesting stuff here. So I get this Rabbit MQ command prompt. Uh, this is kind of similar to what I would get on Linux if I had Xterm. Uh, it just gives me uh, some convenience batch files that follow the same uh, syntax as the other Rabbit commands. I also have the ability to uh, stop the Rabbit service, start the Rabbit service, or remove the Rabbit service. Again, these are just sort of convenience batch files there. Let me bring up the command prompt. And uh, well, this gives a lot of room to type. But uh, once again, we can do rabbits mq dash, I believe it is plugins, and we can say, was it list? And so we're seeing a very similar list of plugins to what we saw over on Linux. Let me just minimize that. So once again, I can enable rabbits mq management. So it does the same thing. It installs the same plugins, and uh, looks like it failed. Why is it failing? Hmm. This means that I have to restart it. Restart the service. Well, it'd be good to bring up the services anyway. So services.msc, which you should be familiar with on, on Windows. So I should see rabbit in the list here, somewhere. There it is. And it looks like it's not started yet, so maybe we'll just go ahead and start the service. I didn't, I could have started with one of those batch uh, files that we saw on the start menu. Let's try enabling it again. Okay, it's already enabled, I guess, so I had to actually turn it on. So if we go back to the list here, you can see that once again, rabbit MQ management is enabled and those other sort of supporting plugins are also enabled. So if I go to localhost 1562, I'm connecting to my local Windows RabbitMQ, and once again, it's also guest and guest. Now these two um, RabbitMQ servers, the one on my Linux machine and the one on my Windows machine, right now are completely independent. They don't know anything about each other. Hypothetically, I could connect them to each other in a cluster. I'm not going to do that today. I'm probably not going to do that in this series of videos. But if I wanted to scale up RabbitMQ, I could uh, fire up multiple machines and put Rabbit on them and make them all act together as one big cluster. Uh, typically, you'd do this with a set of virtual machines or uh, a bunch of cloud instances, something like that, and not maybe not necessarily physical uh, boxes, but you absolutely could have that option. Okay, so now that we've got RabbitMQ installed on Windows and on Linux, we can look at the management UI, which is going to be identical uh, for both. And we'll just uh, sort of walk through some of the things we'll see in this management UI. Now, don't worry if you don't quite understand or uh, don't explain everything that you see on the screen here. There's plenty of documentation. And in fact, some of this stuff, when we get to the easy net queue, some of it's going to be a little bit abstracted away anyway. Uh, the configuration is, is not going to be as important to us. But we can still see these things in action on the management UI, and that, that is important. So right now we're on the, the overview dashboard here, basically. That gives you a quick view of the message traffic. So the various uh, rates, the messages per second, um, the counts uh, of all the different connections, channels, exchanges, 
queues and uh, consumers. We'll get to those here, but just a, a raw count of them. Um, and we have some other stuff like some file paths where the configurations are uh, and, and so on. Uh, and this also, like I said, about nodes. So when you can cluster together nodes, you would see multiple uh, servers listed here. Um, I don't have that because there's only uh, one of them. Just, just this one node listed here on my desktop. Okay, now we'll go over to connections. This is just a uh, list of connections to RabbitMQ, and there, there are none right now. Um, but this will show things like the protocol, the network traffic, uh, among those connections, and so on. Now we'll go over to channels. So channels is a, is a concept that um, you may or may not have seen before with other queuing systems. But basically a connection is kind of like a, or a channel is like a lightweight connection. So channels, you know, opening and closing connections can be expensive. So channels sort of act as connections, but they share a single connection. So on this screen, we'd see a list of channels, the state of each of those channels, uh, the message rates, and things like that. But again, we haven't actually connected, so we don't see anything here just yet. Next tab is called Exchanges. And Exchanges take a message and route it into a queue, which is the next thing we'll see. Uh, so there's lots of cool stuff we can do with, with routing in Rabbit. These are just some um, of the system um, exchanges that are built in, come with it, that allow for logging and tracing and so on. Uh, once we start writing code, we'll actually create our own exchanges, or at least an exchange. So you'll see uh, a list of exchanges, you'll see the, the names, which are very important as we get to learn more about exchanges, and the message rates in and message rates out. And then finally we get to the queues, and the queues are kind of like mailboxes, so the exchanges can route messages, but the queues are actually where they, where they end up. Uh, so me messages go into the queue and then they get retrieved from the queue. Uh, so on this screen we normally see a list of queues, and queues have names, they have a number of messages in them, and we'll also see message rates for those as well. Um, we could potentially examine messages in the queues on the screen uh, for debugging purposes or, or what have you. Um, but again, we don't see anything yet because we haven't actually coded anything. And then finally there's an admin screen. This is where you'd probably want to change the password or add uh, new users or change users, things like that. Um, I'm just going to stick with uh, guest and guest for now, just for ease of use. So that is that is it. Well, setting up Rabbit and setting up the management UI. I encourage you to try this yourself with Linux or with Windows or with uh, some other system. And tell me how it goes. Leave a comment. Um, if I've gotten anything wrong, especially if you have any tips or any more information you'd like to share about the management UI, it would all be appreciated. Thank you very much for watching.